294. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, trying to follow our Savior and King, shaping our lives by His blessed example. Happy, how happy the songs that we bring. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of life. Pressing more closely to Him who is leading, when we are tempted to turn from the way. Trusting the arm that is strong to defend us, happy, how happy our praises each day. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of light. Walking in footsteps of gentle forbearance, footsteps of faithfulness, mercy, and love. Looking to Him for the grace freely promised, happy, how happy, our journey above. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light, stepping in the light. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of life. Trying to walk in the steps of the Savior, upward, still upward, we'll follow our guide. When we shall see Him, the King in His beauty, happy, how happy, our place at His side. How beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, stepping in the light. Stepping in the light, how beautiful to walk in the steps of the Savior, led in paths of love. Brother Jason, will you open up in a word of prayer? You may be seated. 310, 310, Footprints of Jesus. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling, come follow me. And we see where thy footprints falling, Lead us to Thee, footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountain, seeking His sheep. So long, fountains have been the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. If they lead through the temple holy, Preaching the word, or in homes of the poor and lonely, serving the Lord. Footprints of Jesus. 
us that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. Then at last when on high he sees us our journey done. We will rest where the hopes of Jesus end. And his throne, footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. It's great to see each of you here this evening. Trust you've had a wonderful afternoon. Glad to see you've made it back, and I think most everyone's power is back on. So please continue to pray for the many requests that have been mentioned. Um, don't forget about uh, Justin Anderson. This is Brother McCroy's son-in-law with his um, uh, surgery today. Continue to pray that he recovers quickly. Also continue to pray for um, Brother Stevens and his health issues, that God will continue to bless there and give him strength. Also looking forward to the rest of the week. Don't forget about, of course, our Wednesday service and then our July cookout on July 1st. If you're interested in, in helping to grill hot dogs and hamburgers, please make sure you see me or one of the tailors, and we'll, we'll give you more information on that as well. As we look forward to this week, please remember to continue to pray for the Matt and Amanda Smith family, our missionaries to Columbia. Be a part, we are a partner of their ministry financially, but we want to make sure we're also a partner of their ministry through prayer, a far greater ministry. So continue to pray for them as well as for each other and the numerous requests that are represented in this room and in our, in our extended congregation. In 324, 324, draw me nearer. Thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice, and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by the power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Draw me nearer, nearer. Blessed Lord, swear thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I come in as friend with friend. Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Let's all stand on the last. There are depths of love that I cannot know Till I cross the narrow sea There are heights of joy that I may not reach Till I rest in peace with thee Draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord To the cross where thou hast died Draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. Brother Taylor, we ask for his blood upon the offering.
Dear gracious Lord in heaven, thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the safety you give us during the storms. Thank you for watching over us and protecting us. With a little bit of suffering, we knew that you were in control throughout the whole For all that you do, just thank you for the day where the preaching never stopped, dear Lord. Back on hearing your word preached. Thank you for the opportunity with us during the service, be those who are most self special other boys. Son law, dear Lord, just be with him. Help that family where help is needed. Presence is needed. You may be seated. We'll be in Joshua chapter number 9 this evening. Joshua chapter number 9. Joshua chapter number 9. Last couple weeks in the book of Joshua, we found that, of course, unfortunately for the people of Israel, they've had a couple rough days. But thankfully, as they came, come through chapter number 8, they finally defeat their foes at Ai. God gives them the victory, but as they follow, of course, His plan... We come to chapter number 9, unfortunately, however, it seems like they don't quite learn their lesson. Sometimes it seems like for most of us, it takes us a few tries before we learn our lesson, doesn't it? In fact, it seems like the Lord continually makes us repeat the same lesson again and again and again until we finally get it. Well, <laughs> right after Joshua chapters number 7 and 8, where, of course, the children of Israel failed to follow through failed to find out exactly what the issue was in their kingdom, exact, excuse me, in their nation, what the issue was before and after the defeated Ai. We come to chapter number 9 and we find the same thing. But we find a different temptation that results from, a diff different temptation and different judgment that results from their inability or refusal or failure to remember to consult the Lord. We're going to be looking at the, tr at, at the diplomatic issues of, of of Israel this evening. We understand as we look at di di diplomacy around the world, I don't know if you're a fan of what most of our diplomats are doing. I'm not, don't mean to criticize our State Department, but I have to admit sometimes I scratch my head as I see what they're doing around the globe. Sometimes I'm afraid they've become more, more uh, energized by a social agenda than by actual the well-being of our country in the last couple of years. Absolutely tragic when things get out of hand in that fashion, let alone the other, the other agendas that are going on. We understand that if we're not careful from a diplomatic point of view, it is easy to get drawn into somebody else's problems. We understand even from history, we think of some of the famous coalitions that have occurred in the years past and how that simply the wrong ties with the wrong people can be absolutely disastrous. I remember the early 2000s and our, our usage of the term coalition as we were trying to, trying to take care of issues in the Middle East. But the actual, the term coalition is actually much older than that. One of the first usages of the word was actually in the coalition wars. They had seven of them, right back to back to back to back. And these coalitions made our modern coalitions seem like a joke. We look at NATO nowadays in the EU and we wonder, and sometimes we appreciate them, and sometimes we think that they're going to get themselves in trouble. But they were nothing like the coalitions of the late 1700s and early 1800s. In fact, our country got drawn into one of them, believe it or not. These coalition wars, if you recall and rewind far enough back into history, most of them had to do with Napoleon. Napoleon either trying to defeat someone and everyone coming against him, or people trying to fight against Napoleon back and forth, as European wars get 
things got complicated very quickly. One of the most interesting of the coalitions was actually the sixth coalition, though. The largest coalition to date that I can find of, a, of, of an army coming together. In fact, from what my understanding, the entire strength of one of the coalitions um, was well over one million soldiers. One million actual soldiers in the, in the late or early 1800s, and the other side had almost 700,000 soldiers. Now that may be, that is impressive. It is even more impressive when you remember exactly why the war started. Napoleon had come back out of exile, and he was wanting to somehow increase the number of troops he had. But as European wars go, people switch sides all the time. Well, Napoleon had found himself almost by himself. He was allied with Italy, Poland, because the Poles didn't really like anyone, because no one liked the Poles. Can't blame them on that one. But he was allied with the Poles and, at the time, the Russians. But the Russians decided to switch sides. And so one of the most famous uh, military disasters of all time took place. It was Napoleon's defeat of Russia. And believe it or not, from a historical perspective, did you know that Napoleon actually won that battle? We laugh because we know historically that was not exactly a battle that was worth winning. In fact, as he withdrew, basically what had happened is the Russians, as their, as their um, custom is, they let you invade, and then they wait you out till winter comes, and then they come back and kill all of you. And this is exactly what had happened. From my understanding, Napoleon lost 370,000 troops just by invading Moscow. He lost another 200,000 ca being captured. By the time he finally left Russia, he only had 27,000 troops left. Now, don't worry, the Russians were also depleted. They lost 400,000 men in the process. 400,000 men. Between the two of them, they lost almost a million men in this one little, one little episode of this whole event. But you know what that event was the beginning of? It was all because Russia and France, France did not want Russia to leave their allegiance. They didn't want them to leave their military ties. In that particular case, we saw, see how it is disastrous for the Tsars to have made any type of allegiance with Napoleon. Now, from a random bit of history, as they move into the War of the, uh, the, the Sixth Coalition, we see the problem gets even worse. We find not only is France desperate for troops out of because of how many they've lost, we find even Britain, who was allied with the other side, who Russia joined, Russia and basically the whole world fought against Napoleon. What is interesting is in our American history, there's one little bit of history we forget. And that's the fact that we were involved in the War of the Sixth Co Coalition. We call it the War of 1812. We didn't mean to fight for that side, but what happened is, well, the Brits were so desperate for troops, they kept stealing our sailors. And as a result, we kicked them out of our country again. In our minds, it's one of the most important wars of our history but it was merely a drop in the bucket for the bloodshed that was set, shed in that particular war on a worldwide perspective. Now, from that perspective, I want us to take that idea and realize that sometimes our associations can be disastrous. In 1812, we did not want to be part of the disasters that were going on in Europe. But here we also find that, unfortunately for Russia and some of the others, because of their past allegiances, it led them down a path they did not want to go. We come to Joshua chapter number 9, and we see there's a great value to allegiances, a great value to making strong packs and ties, but we also find the grave danger. One of the greatest dangers that we find is the fact that in chapter number 9 is the children of Israel, before they made an allegiance and an association, they forgot to ask God. Now, in all fairness, this is not the only group of the children of Israel that have sought to do this we'll find that nearly every single generation of God's people tries to make an allegiance with the world's powers. You'll find all the way through the prophets, they'll make an allegiance with the, the, the Egyptians. Some will try to make an allegiance with Assyrians, some with the Babylonians. Everyone is always trying to look for the world for help. Let's also go to our modern era, and we won't touch any of the geopolitical issues nowadays, but from a spiritual point of view. 
For years, we as Christians have been trying to go to the world for help or for approval, which is even more disturbing. I was reading some books recently, very interesting, but they outline the history of how so many people lose their doctrine because they try to appeal to a secular society that doesn't believe in God. They try to say, we are just as scientifically sound as you, which is true, but they try to do it by proving that they also don't believe in God. Absolutely absurd. And in the end, some of these individuals that I believe know the Lord, some of them still believe in the virgin birth and the death of Christ, the resurrection of Christ, they just don't want to admit it out loud. But in the end, they also lose their Bible. You'll see as they go through and they'll try to read their Bible, they'll have to debate every single word whether this is this God's word. Is it preserved for me or is it not? Why do they do that? Because they want to appear approved in the eyes of secular society. God did not come to approve secular society, nor does he need man's approval. And that is what we're going to see in this passage. Unfortunately for the people of Israel, they get mixed up here in this, this mess in the very beginning. The Bible says in, in Joshua 9, verse number 1, And it came to pass when all the kings which were on this side of Jordan, in the hills and in the valleys and all the coasts of the great sea, over against Lebanon, the Hittite, the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Perizzite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, heard thereof, that they gathered themselves together to fight with Joshua and with Israel with one accord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, as we come before you, we praise you for your goodness and your love to us. Lord, we ask us to please open up our hearts and our minds to this passage. Lord, help us to do it justice. But Lord, help us be very careful in how we interpret it, but also how we apply it to our lives. Help us not to make the same mistakes here, but rather rely upon you for both our direction and our daily lives and our associations. And help us to remember that we rely on you, not on the strength of man. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. First thing we're going to look at is the opposition. You'll find that every time that we have a problem, we typically try to find an, an ally, don't we? Wasn't this the problem in World War II? We found that the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now, we say that. We quote, of course, I believe it's several uh, Islamic thinkers. It's one of their many adages. But is it true? Well, we found out the hard way that it was not true after World War II, as we tried to make, we tried very hard to make the Soviets our allies. But what did that end up in creating? A bigger problem. We tried to make a, the Soviets and the communistic Chinese our allies. And we ended up fighting North, the North Korean conflict as well as the Vietnam War, partially because we made the wrong allegiances during World War II. Now that's not to fault anyone. We understand there is a danger to this type of thinking. But it's also understandable. Here in this passage, look at the incredible difficulty the people of Israel have. The Bible says, it says, all the kings on this side of Jordan. Anytime all the politicians agree on anything, most of us get very uncomfortable, don't we? Because there's no way that they can all agree on something and it be a good thing. At least that's the way some of us tend to think. But look at what these individuals think. It says, all of these horrible kings, many of them were renowned for their rather debauched lifestyles, as well as for things such as child sacrifice. It was a huge part of their, 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 their worship and their manner of life. So that is just to say the type of violent individuals we're talking about. But they are able to come together with one purpose. And it says they were able to come accord together, in verse number 2, with one accord. And what is that? It is to fight Joshua and Israel. They have one purpose. All of them come together to succeed. Now, I don't know how you would feel if you were an Israelite. I'd be a little concerned. It's, we're talking about a huge, mass amount of people. Think about all of Israel's fighting experience. Well, we, can think, we know that they fought Og on the far side of Jordan and Sihon. But other than that, they have not really had any serious battles. They had Jericho for sure, but it's hard to say that you're a great military champion whenever the walls fell down on your enemy before you came through and finished them off. Same thing with Ai. Not only did they fight Ai, a much weaker town, they actually did it through an ambush. As God said, remember, my wisdom is greater than yours. But it's not like they've had a tremendous amount of experience, and now all these kings are coming together to kill them. I would be terrified. 
But we find here that these people of Israel knew that God could still work through a small amount. They had just seen their own defeat at the hands of the people of Ai. God had made it so abundantly clear that God does not need a great majority. David will later put it very well in Psalm 3. He'll say, Lord, how are they increased that troubled me? Many are they that rise up against me. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God, Selah. I love Psalm 3. It's one of the most classic of Psalms because it talks about David's fears, David's problems, but it also talks about God's solution. So as David goes through, he says, there are many that trouble me. Everyone says that God won't even help me. Now, there are many people who will say that nowadays. There are many who will believe that very clearly that God does not exist, therefore there's no help for you in God. There are also those, especially in David's life, as well as even the people of, of Israel's, who will say that, remember, God is on our side, not yours. Always a disturbing place to be. Well, here in this passage, he says, remember, I have a huge problem. He even uses the word selah here. A stop, meditate, think, and, 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 and evaluate these statements. But then he goes on in verse number three. But thou, O Lord, art, my she- art a shield for me, my glory and the lifter up of mine head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of, the, out of his holy hill. David says, I have a great problem. A huge problem, but God heard me. Verse number five, he says, I laid, me down and sl- I laid me down and slept. I awaked for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me around about. Now recall, David is a, is a man of war. A man who has literally fought numerous people, hand-to-hand combat. He knows what it's like to have more than one opponent. He knows what it's like to come near the the point of death. And this is the word he uses. He says, I can sleep even though I feel like I'm surrounded by tens of thousands of people all out to get me because God's in charge. He says in verse number seven, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for thou hast smitten all mine enemies upon the cheekbone. Thou hast broken the teeth of the ungodly. I love the graphic language here because it does carry the point very well. Just like someone losing teeth in a fight says, that's what my God's going to do to you. My God will protect me. Of course, there's another imagery here as well, as we'll see in some other passage. We also see that that sometimes the psalmist will refer to God breaking out the, the, the teeth of a lion, taking away their power. But anyways, verse number eight, he reminds us very succinctly, salvation belongeth unto the Lord. Salvation is not in number. Salvation is not in strength. God's help is not, is not dependent upon our human abilities. Now, of all the people in the world, I think the children of Israel should have remembered that. They had just seen the Jordan River parted. They had just seen the walls of Jericho fall. They had just seen God help them through a physical battle. But unfortunately, they forget yet again. It is true. They have tremendous opposition But unfortunately for them, they are going to take their eyes, just like Peter took his eyes off of the Lord and looked at the water. It appears in this passage, the children of Israel look at everything except God. Verse number 11, and further down through this passage, we'll see, verse number 14, excuse me, we'll see that the men do not take counsel of the Lord. They look at all the rational reasons, but not the spiritual so we see they have a problem, but I want us to look at next the observation of, of those that are coming, trying to make a league with them. The Bible says in verse number three, and when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard that Joshua had done unto, what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work willily and went out as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clouded upon their feet and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provisions was dry and moldy. Here we look at the observation, what the people of Israel see. They've seen their opposition. They have a problem, a serious problem. But now all of a sudden, all they see is is another group of people that are coming to them that appear weak. It's an ingenious plan, as we'll see here in just a moment. 
But imagine if you were Israel. All of a sudden, I see someone that is not a threat. Can you imagine all this time, everyone you looked at in the land was a potential threat? They're all out to kill you. In fact, they all have tried in the past, if we rewind quite a few hundred years. But here in this passage, all of a sudden, they see someone that doesn't look threatening. We understand that whenever we're out, whenever you're in a new place and you're worried about your security, especially an area that has high crime, you always look for people that are engaged in gang activity. But the smart criminals don't do that. They know they're supposed to dress up a little, don't they? That's kind of the idea here. These individuals know that they're supposed to put on a costume. I know there are several yard sailors in here. What, what do you do when you're out yard sailing if you really want a good deal? You don't put your Sunday best on, do you? You don't put your nice shoes on, your shirt and tie on. Of course not. Even if you go, now I know, maybe you're not as cheap as I am. But even when you go buy a different car, you make sure you don't wear your best clothes, right? Even if you don't want sympathy, at least you don't want them thinking that they, there's a lot of money to be made here. Well, that's exactly what these people do. The reality is our human intelligence and our ability to observe God's world is a gift that is given to us by God. But it is also a gift that can be manipulated. This is why God will say, when it, God, through, of course, Samuel, will say whenever the children of Israel want a king... God will remind them, remember, I look on the heart, but man looks on the outward appearance. Here in this passage, the people of Israel rely on their physical observation. They see in this passage, look at what they do. They make up themselves as if they were ambassadors. In other words, they make sure they don't look like warriors, anything but warriors. They make sure they wear their baggy clothing, maybe clothing that is, as we see here in this passage, they take older clothing and older supplies, so much so they even take their old shoes, their shoes that have holes in them. Some of us are bad about throwing things away. Some of you are really good at it. But some of us just can't bring ourselves to throw away an old pair of boots because you never know when you're going to need them again, even though you probably haven't worn them in a year and probably never will again. But evidently in Gibeah, there were a few people who kept their old shoes around and they went and collected them. Also, we see here in this passage, we make sure, they make sure that they find bread that is dry and moldy. Very intelligent what they're trying to do. Now, if you remember the, um, the Chinese philosopher who said, uh, Sun Tzu, when he's ever he's talking about making plans for a war, he says, remember, appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak. That's exactly what they're trying to do. They're trying to deceive. Now, I feel bad for the children of Israel. They have one group of people that want to destroy them and out and out aggression, another group that wants to deceive them. But unfortunately for them, or f they don't remember who's their greatest help. Their God would be able to tell them and help them discern between both of these groups. Unfortunately for them, they forget. So now let's move on from the observation. We're going to look at the offer that is made. The Bible says in verse 6, and they went to Joshua unto the camp at Gilgal and said unto him and to the men of Israel, We be come from a far country, now therefore make ye a league with us. And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, unto the Hivites Peradventure ye dwell among us, and how shall we make a league with you? There starts off this initial, this initial discussion. Now we do see that this, they're going to come up with a contract in just a moment. But so we do need to remember, of course, they do violate their contract. They start off by saying, we are from a far country. This is an out-and-out -out lie. Now, I only say that because there are some who argue about what the best course of action for the children of Israel should have been after this whole event goes down. But we'll get there in just a moment. But anyway, they start out with this lie. He says, And the men of Israel said unto the Hivites, Peradventure ye dwell among us. How and how shall we make a league with you? Basically, the idea is we aren't a threat. We are not from around here, so therefore we can't be threatening. Therefore, you need to make a league with us. The reality, however, is the fact that the children of Israel had been explicitly warned not to make leagues with other nations. They had been warned, don't make alliances with these people. It will only lead you to heartache and trouble. 
we will find that that is exactly what happens as a result of this passage. But he says, don't, don't do it. Don't make a league with them. But the real, as we come through, we see that this is the initial discussion. We get to the counteroffer next. And they said unto Joshua, verse number 8, We are thy servants. And Joshua said unto them, Who are ye? And from whence come ye? So they start making offers. And they go from the idea of that we, not only do we look non-threatening, but we also can bring something to the table. We offer you something. Now, the logic here is a little flawed. Because if we're from a far country, how can we be your servants? Now, granted, perhaps the language here is just a little bit more along the idea of being respectful. But here in this case, it says, they, they said, Joshua goes on and says, Who are ye, and, we, and whence come ye? They simply say, A far country, and we are come because of the name of the Lord thy God, for, for we have heard of the fame of him and all that he did in Egypt. Notice as we come through here, they offer their services. Previously, they initially started out with the idea that they need a league because they're weak and from a far country. Then we see that they go to the fact that they offer servitude and an alliance. And then finally, they offer the worship of God. Now, I'm not saying that this was an insincere desire. But notice it's the third thing that they offer. They offer, yes, we heard about your God but it's only the third thing they stop to mention. I have to admit that I kind of doubt it. We, re we rewind several chapters when we go back to Rahab. Rahab sought God. Rahab sought and made it very clear that she believed in this God. That was one of the first things she mentioned. She believed that God had given them this land. In this, this particular case, it appears that these individuals are simply making any, any type of claim that can stick, any type of pull they can, make, they can get with the children of Israel. They even stoop to flattery, we see in verse number 10. And all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites that were beyond Jordan, to Sion, king of Heshbon, and to Og, king of Bashan, which was at Ashtaroth. In fact, it almost seems as if they're beginning to butter up the people a little bit. Look at how much you, God has done through you. He's given you great victories. We're warned against flattery in Proverbs 20, 19, and then in Proverbs 26, 28. Always a concern whenever you listen to flattery. Well, what do you want out of me? There's not very many better flatter, flatterers in the world than that of a salesman, right? We've all met good salesmen. Those, they, know, they know how to flatter you, how to get on your good side. Not saying that is wrong. They're making, they're making their living. I understand that. But it's also a fear that we must, we must be very careful of, even when we talk about false teachers and those who will lead us astray. Or those in the world who will try to take us away from our Lord. Here in this case, they make sure that they, they, they're doing everything they possibly can. Verse number 11. Wherefore our elders and all the inhabitants of our country spake to us, saying, Take victuals with you for, your, for the journey and go to meet them. And say unto them, We are your servants. Therefore make ye a league with us. Not only do they offer flattery, but they also go one step further. Notice how many times that they mention their victuals. They really want to show off their moldy bread. Makes a lot of sense if that is what you're trying to accomplish. But we also see in this particular case, they also appeal not only to not only to, the, to the, the ego of those they're talking to, but we also see they appeal to the good-naturedness as well. Verse number 12. This our bread we took hot for our provision out of our houses on the day we came forth to go unto you. But now, behold, it is dry and it is moldy. And these bottles of wine which we filled were new. And behold, they, were rent, they be rent. And these are garments and our shoes are become old by reason of the very long journey. Now, I believe compassion is an essential part of what God expects his children to have. God expects you and I to be compassionate and be merciful. We also understand that from a human point of view, I believe that God created us with a desire to, avoid, to help others avoid suffering. The devil's no fool, though. The devil knows how to use and, and misuse that desire when it comes to twisting our compassion and our goodwill for others. 
You'll find this all throughout Scripture. In fact, a very fascinating study is whenever you look at David. If you look at David and what David did with Absalom and what he did not do, and what he did with his son Amnon and what he did not do. Yes, David did feel, apparently felt guilty for a lot of what occurred, but you also notice that David refused to act when acting would have reduced the suffering because David seems to be more concerned with reducing his son's suffering than the suffering they're causing. In that particular case, we find, as I heard one preacher, one preacher describe it as misplaced affection. God expects us to show love, but at the same time, he doesn't expect us to show love in the wrong places. Here we go to the New Testament. You'll find, and in, in we look at the first, second, and third John, beautiful books. But if you recall, one of the books is addressed to the elect lady. We went through that several weeks ago on Mother's Day. There was a concern for her, concern for her and the church that was in her house, from what we can tell, because they were so concerned with being kind, charitable, and compassionate that they had let false teachers in. There was a concern for that. And, of course, they have to address that and said, remember, it's, there's nothing wrong with you, with you being compassionate, showing grace, showing kindness, but let us also remember that you're not doing it. You're not, you should not be doing it to someone who's leading others away, someone who is trying to deceive. And this passage, that is exactly what happens here. It appears like they're made very, very clear. All of our hearts go out when we see someone who doesn't have the, pro, have the clothes they need or the, or the things they need. But in this particular case, it is not true. It is a falsehood. It is a very carefully manipulated um, ruse. Verse number 14, the Bible says, And the men took of their victuals and asked not counsel at the mouth of the Lord. This, I believe, is probably the most tragic verse here in this passage, especially in the context of the ones that we just looked at. In fact, you go back to the, before the, the first defeated Ai, this verse is not included in that chapter or a verse like it. But we know for sure in this passage that the people simply don't take the time to ask God. We know that the Bible had not been completely written. There were several things in this passage that already should have sent up red flags. Like, why are you asking us in this new land for an allegiance? Why are you seeking to make an allegiance with a nomadic people, and yet you know where they are right now? Some of the intelligence just doesn't seem to add up. There are some red flags. There's also the red flag that God had already made it very clear not to make allegiances with people of the land. Presumably, that would also apply to this group. There were already some things that they should not have done. However, that last little bit of safety is asking God. I do believe that there are some things that we don't need to ask God about. There are some issues in the Bible God makes so abundantly clear that there's no reason for us to sit around asking him about his opinion on it. He already gave us his opinion. But we also, need to be, we also can remember that God, even in our confusion, can still cut through when we stop to ask his opinion. In this particular case, they don't even pause to ask. One of the most tragic verses of this passage. Anyways, verse number 15, we find that they make a peace with them and made a league with them to let them live. And the prince of the congregation swear unto them. Verse number 16, we find that as the children of Israel go along three days later, we find that they come across their villages. So already these people have breached their contract. And so the Bible says in verse number 17, and the children of Israel journeyed and came unto their cities on the third day. Now their cities were Gibeon and Sheshpharah and Beeroth and kirjath Jerem. And the children of Israel smote them not, because the prince of the congregation had sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. And all the congregation murmured against the princes. Verse number 19, But all the, congreg but all the princes said unto the, all the congregation, we have sworn unto them by the Lord God of Israel. Now, therefore, we may not touch them. Now, this is an interesting question. What would you have done if you were in the, in the prince's shoes? The people want to do what's right. But the princes have made, a, have made a covenant with these people that they don't know what to do. We go to other passages of Scripture, we can find that God does make it clear that if you, if you make a covenant that is against his word, that you're not supposed to keep it. 
But that passage has not been written yet. So what do they do? What would you have done? Well, we can always say that they could have referred to Rahab and the, and the principle there. You could have referred to the fact that they'd breached their own contract by false pretenses. But whatever the case is what we do find is what they choose to do. I find it interesting that I don't know that they didn't refer to the Lord again, but we don't necessarily see them seeking God's wisdom for even how to resolve this issue. The princes don't want to break their word. The Bible says, And the princes said unto them, Let them live, but let them be hewers of wood and draw, draw, drawers of water unto all the congregation, and the, as the princes had promised them. And Joshua called for them, and he spake unto them, saying, Wherefore have ye beguiled us, saying, We are very far from you, when ye dwell among us. Now therefore ye are cursed, and ye shall, there shall none of you be freed from being bondmen, and hewers of wood, and drawers of water for the house of my God. And they answered Joshua and said, Because it was certainty, told, certainly told of thy servants, how that the Lord thy God commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land, and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land. From before you, therefore we were sore afraid of for our lives because of you, and have done this thing. And now, behold, we are in thine hand, as it seemeth good and right unto thee to do unto us. To do. And so he did unto them, and delivered them out of the hand of the children of Israel, but they slew them not. In this passage, we find that it's an interesting solution. Basically, they said, Well, you don't have any voting rights in, in, in our group. Well, that's understandable. You don't have any position of power, that's understandable. You're also limited in the jobs you are and are not allowed to have. In fact, you're supposed to be helping the Levites as one of the predominant jobs of these individuals. Not supposed to be part of the skilled, upper, the, the skilled, the skilled merchants. I understand what they're trying to do, and it makes perfect sense. They're trying to limit the ability of these people to change the direction of the nation. However... It is not God's plan. It was not God's original plan. Interesting, it sounds as if they're almost trying to start up the, the, the often tried and often failed attempt to start, set up a two-state solution. Even back then, every time it's been tried, it seems like it kind of runs, runs away with it. But here in this passage, we find it does lead Israel down a road that they probably would not have wanted to go down. There is a simple solution. Number one, obey God. Number two, ask God. There, is a, there were a lot of reasons for Israel. Perhaps they were feeling rather ostracized and no one wanted to play with them. But finally, someone wants to get along with them. Maybe that was the goal. Maybe it was fear. They had a big problem. But whatever the case, they make a poor solution. If you go through your Bible, you'll find that this poor solution leads them down a road that is of utter tragedy. You go to the early part of the, of, the, of the kingdom portion of Israel, you'll find that Israel actually has to go to a war to help these people. Israel is in a very awkward place because they don't necessarily want the people of Gibeon being able to destroy them, but at the same time, they feel that they have a need to protect them. It puts Israel in a very awkward and horrific place that ultimately cost Israel lives. Why? Because Israel made a poor decision. We see in our culture all the time that many times these, many of these same appeals are made to us as Christians or frankly made to our society. Appeals to our emotions, appeal to our better nature, our compassion, appeals to our pride and ego. But that doesn't mean they're good appeals. I know we often, we often poke fun at charitable endeavors that go awry because they happen so often. God does expect you and I to be charitable. God does expect us to look out for those who cannot look out for themselves. But we also understand there sometimes these go wildly astray. Wildly astray. A few years ago, I think we mentioned, of course, uh, I think it was the case of Ethiopia and one of their famines. Everyone here in the States and around the Western world gathered up tons of money and sent it over there. What we didn't realize until later is that we actually sent the money and the goods to the one individual causing the famine. Well, there's also another trend that some economists have noted that one of the reasons why, why Africa continually struggles financially is because of our charity. Think about it with me. Imagine you were a farmer in Africa. The one thing that Africa should have no problems in doing is farming. They have a wonderful climate for it. 
should be able to produce all the food you can imagine. Imagine you're a farmer over there. And then every time that a rich American feels their heartstrings pulled, they send thousands and thousands of dollars of free food to Africa. What would happen to your farm? It'd go out of business, of course. And that's exactly what happens. We, our hearts feel, feel for the people, but at the same time, maybe we should think about the solutions a little bit before we try to add a, an emotional solution that doesn't actually result in any, good, in, any good, in any good resolution. That appears to be a very similar situation to what we see here in this passage. Joshua and the elders of Israel see a group of people that appear needy, that appear harmless. But they're neither needy nor harmless. In fact, they actually cause a great deal of harm to Israel in the long run simply by beginning to, you, to draw Israel into an alliance that leads them down the road of causing greater problems. I doubt that many of us have this particular issue in, in, in mind on our daily basis, but we do know that the Bible reminds us, even as we looked at on Wednesday night, that evil communications corrupt good manners. The word communications literally are associations. Yes, the words we choose, but also what we allow into our minds, our hearts, and even our closest associations and friends. This is why the New Testament will remind us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Not that we shouldn't have friends and be influenced and be an influencer and point them to Christ, not at all. But rather, remember, don't get led astray. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on God's word and God's commands. Don't, let your, don't lean into your own understanding. And God says that is enough. So let's learn from Israel yet again and remember to look to God for counsel from God as well as seeking to abide by God's commands. I don't know exactly what they were thinking here, but whatever the case, it is not God's plan. So let us also avoid that same mistake by making sure we look to God for guidance in our lives. If you join me in standing, we'll close in a word of prayer. Father, as we come before you, we praise you for your goodness. Lord, we know in your word that you have repeatedly reminded us that you are the solution to our problems. Help us not to look to man's solutions for our problems. Lord, also help us not to be manipulated by, by either our emotions that have run astray or improper thinking or anything else. But Lord, help us as entire beings to be submissive to your will and your guidance in our lives. Help us to seek to learn from your word that we might be able to glorify you on a daily basis, be able to have your wisdom and your prudence. Lord, we especially ask you to work in our hearts as we seek to be an influence in our community and be able to encourage those around us. Lord, we ask you to please be with us this week. We ask this in your son's name.